County REMC is proud to offer the new Faster Exceed satellite internet service. They can now connect customers to their fastest satellite internet service ever with broadband speeds up to 12 megabytes per second. For homeowners with fewer options for internet service or who live in rural areas, there's no better option than Exceed Broadband. Share photos remarkably fast. Enjoy better video chat with less jitter. Send and receive files quickly. Exceptionally fast web browsing and email. Listen to streaming music. If you're ready for a faster internet connection, you're ready for Exceed Broadband. Call 574-223-3156 today to learn more about the amazingly fast Exceed Broadband service offered by your local Fulton County REMC, your touchstone energy provider. And now take $50 off all new Exceed internet installs with your Fulton County REMC. Call them today. Don't miss your chance to play in tonight's Hoosier Lotto drawing. The jackpot is giant. An estimated $23.5 million. Stop by a retailer to ask for a quick pick before tonight's drawing. Who's your jackpots? Hometown dreams. Play responsibly. 67 degrees outside the window on 8th Street, 92.1 WROI. WROIFM.com. Streaming audio live on RTC Channel 5. Audio and soon-to-be video on RTC Channel 4. Tim has his own sleeping bag stowed up here at the radio station, yeah. right, Tim? I'm just a resident now. That a guy. Yeah. Yep, just a resident. New new address here at 110 East State Street, yeah. right? Welcome. Thank you. Nice to have you. Yeah. John Halley's here, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Good morning, John. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, it's always a pleasure. To Before come down we here. get into the hospital report, uh, uh, October fourteenth, you got a big day coming up. We got a big day coming in downtown right. Rochester. We got the uh, the chili cook off and the car show coming to town. So uh, I've put in a request for some really nice weather. Excellent. Sunny, about seventy two. Oh, so perfect. We're hoping that comes uh, comes to the the window for us, and you know we're getting. a Real good response. We've been doing a lot of car shows around the, the state this year, passing out flyers. And a lot of folks uh, showing some interest to come to the car show. They've uh, kind of expressed, you know, I'm a little biased because we kind of put it on. But we're getting a lot of feedback saying it's one of the better car shows that they've gone to. Uh, high quality cars here. Exactly. And, and uh, put on, you know, really nice. We run a pretty good uh, show, pretty efficient with it. So uh, looking to get the hopefully six, 700 cars in downtown wow, Rochester. Wow, that'd be, uh, that'd be awesome. I know in the past we've we've run four to five to 600, so that's great. Yeah, so let's so uh, break our, that record this yeah, time our, around. One of the goals that one of the members says he wants to get 1,000 cars in town. <laughs> and we've tried to figure out where to put 1,000 cars. That's right. <laughs> and I think we're going to have to double stack them. But uh, we, we're hoping for really nice weather because we're it's so weather dependent uh, for Absolutely. a car show. And, uh, you know, we get some nice sunny weather, maybe cool in the morning, clear off. I, I think we'll have a really good turnout. And one of the things we're bringing to town this year that uh, is really unique and uh, kind of different is there's a traveling automobile history museum. Oh, that's cool. That's going to be brought into town. We've uh, got with the you know State Historical Society, and it, it's been all around the state, so we was able to get it booked to come here. So it's a, kind of a semi-trailer. You can go in one end, out the other, and throughout that is the history of what Indiana has done with automobiles from the very beginning all the way through. And it's really interesting. A lot of nice information. You know, even folks who think they know everything, they kind of go, oh, <laughs> didn't know that. So didn't know that. that's going to be an exciting addition this year to the car show. So definitely get folks come out. Uh, nice day. Have some chili. Sure. Look at some cars. Go sure. through the car museum. Uh, it's just a fun day for everybody. Do you get a yellow vest? I, they hand me one, but I don't wear it. Ah, uh, you don't? I'm okay. one of those rebels. I'm not I'm not real <laughs> real good with yellow vests. I see. <laughs> but you'll be helping to park them, I'll right? I'll be helping to park. Okay. Uh, yeah. As the cars come into town, uh, I'm usually the first person that they kind of have to deal with. And <laughs> as we discussed earlier, I enjoy telling people where to go. Uh, so we have a fun time doing that. And, uh, you know, I, that way I get to see every car that comes into the car Ooh, show. that's cool. So that's kind yeah. of one of the benefits that I see Absolutely. every one of the cars usually get a lot of interaction with the folks in the cars. I have a good time doing that and I think I just kind of sets the atmosphere for the rest of the day for them. If we kind of start it off fun, keep it fun the whole day for them. Cars come in early, don't they? We'll have cars probably 6.15, right. 6.30 in the morning starting to show up because, you know, they've got that spot they want to get in and uh, <laughs> kind of the prize area is around the courthouse. Sure. So, uh, you know, that fills in first and then we start doing the streets and then head north on Main Street and uh, got a swap meet this year. We'll be at the okay. north end and then, again, the car museum is going to be there. Uh, really exciting about this year, praying for really nice weather. Okay. 
and uh, just going to be a lot of things for the folks to do. I think even uh, the chamber has got quite a few chili teams this Actually, year. Actually, more than uh, more than ever, I think. Yeah, so it's you know it's starting to build up to be a fairly major event for the city of Rochester, and uh, we're just happy that we can be a part of that. Bring a lot of folks so they can see our downtown area and uh, just get you know used to coming to Rochester. October the fourteenth. Mark that down. Yes. Hospital board in session, John. Yes, yes, they uh, kind of a short board meeting. It was one of those. Uh, it was you know Randall's last board meeting after 16 years. Congratulations, and, uh, Randall. Well yeah, done. it. Uh, you know, it was. He was here when I came here, so it was been fun learning from him the history of the community, the history of the hospital, and you know, to me, history tells you uh, is a good predictor what the future is. So it was nice to be able to pick his brain and you know how was things before I came to town and what happened because you can learn from that past and help guide the future. So we'll miss him. He did inform me that he might come back every now and then just to harass me from the back of the room. And uh, I told him I would be welcome him in because uh, he has been a valuable asset to the hospital and to me as coming on board as a you know, new sure. member to the community. Wealth of information that Randall had. So, uh, you know, we look forward to him relaxing a little bit in his retirement, but do hope he comes back to visit us. Being on a hospital board isn't something you just pick up overnight, is it? No, it, it's a fairly... You have to unlearn most of your business practices right. because it's kind of run the opposite of any other business. And that's hard for those folks who've been very successful in business to come in and say, well, what do you mean you bill and they don't pay? <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's just part of it. And uh, so it takes a while to really understand the whole dynamics of how the, especially the financial side of healthcare works. And now with some of the new regulations that's come forth from, uh, you know, the Medicare and those folks, they want the board more involved in even the clinical decision making. So not only now are we trying to get into financial, we're having to bring them up to speed on a lot of the clinical aspects of why we do certain things and, you know, what used to be a, a procedure that took two or three days in the hospital, now it's an hour procedure. Exactly. You know, the board needs to be aware of those because, you know, that is part of what they sign off on on all of our various policies and procedures. And when I first got into healthcare, I remember the boards maybe had 10 to 12 policies they would have to sign because it pertained just to them. Now, there's probably two to 3,000 policies that the board are responsible for looking at wow. and signing off on because they want, you know, to make sure that they're aware of what's going on in the facility. So it's it's not an easy job. It's not as easy as it used to be. And it does take time. You know, we got Mr. Strader coming on board. You know, he's going to be kind of in that learning curve probably at least a year to really get up to speed and I think start to understand. And then once you get past usually that 12 to 14 months, it starts making some sense of what we do and they better understand. But it's a fairly steep learning curve right off the bat because it's not a normal business process. Okay. One of the things that uh, you know we're concerned with, uh, as we discussed a little bit at the board meeting, was with Anthem Insurance. They're making some uh, changes come January 1 <clears throat> to what's called their state insurance manual. So it's not our contract with them, but it's kind of the contract they have with the uh, commissioner of insurance. And one of the things what they're wanting to do now <clears throat> excuse me, is once you've come to, if you're an Anthem insurer and you come to our ER, they are going to determine on the backside whether or not that was truly an emergency visit. And if not, they're going to refuse to pay it and say, you as the patient are responsible for that bill. So, you know, it's, it's hard for me to, I guess, get my arms around that, that you're coming to us because you think you're having an emergency situation. But if they deem it on the back end, once they get our bill and review it and say, yeah, it's not an emergency, they're going to refuse to pay it. And then, you know, you'll be responsible for that bill. So that's one aspect. The other one that uh, we're hoping will not affect us very much is some of the radiology procedures. If it is an outpatient order, they will now say you can no longer go to your local hospital to do that. You have to go to a freestanding facility, which would mean you might have to travel up to 30 miles to get your CT, your MRI, or your X-ray. When we talked to Anthem, they said that would, we would probably be exempt here because the closest one to us, there has to be three within a 30-mile radius. There's only one, which is in Plymouth right now. So we're hoping that that, you know, is not going to affect those that have Anthem insurance in our area. But, it, you know, you don't know how this is going to finally shake out. So we're kind of watching that closely. And one of the things that, you know, we're just kind of asking, you know, if you do have Anthem insurance through your employer, 
contact your HR department, make sure they're aware of these changes, and let Anthem know that this is probably not the best thing for the patients. Uh, you know, the, it's putting a lot of the burden on them to make a medical decision-making process on them prior to coming in, and, and we're not we're hoping that somebody says, well, maybe this is not an emergency, and then has a bad outcome because they were afraid they'd have to pay for that bill. So kind of watching that, uh, we're right now it's probably an 80% that it is going to happen. Uh, we haven't heard anything from the commissioner of insurance whether they're going to approve it or not. Okay. Haven't heard that they're not. So okay. uh, it's, it's moving that way. Well, one of the other things about Anthem is they're leaving the Affordable Care Act for the state of Indiana. Right. As of January or January 1, they right. will no longer be in the, any of the uh, uh, programs right. that was, you know, kind of, I guess, the old Obamacare, they've pulled out of all of those programs So because they weren't making enough money. Right. So it's it's kind of leaving the state in a, in a bad position. There are a lot of folks who had insurance will not be able to afford some of the new stuff coming out because there's, the subsidy's not there anymore. So it uh, we're, it's quite a few things happening January 1 with Anthem. We're hoping the commissioner of insurance will look at some of these and say, you know, no, I'm not going to approve that. So kind of sitting on that, but I'm not holding my breath. I'm, I'm not sure where that's going to go. The other thing that came up that a lot of folks, we're seeing more and more of right now, and it's, it's called uh, sepsis. And September is uh, Sepsis Awareness Month. So everybody said, okay, what's that? Well, what it is, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the bodies, and this is from one of my nurses, so I, I will read the technical. They don't let me do the clinical stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, sepsis is the body's overwhelming and potentially life-threatening response to an infection. It can be caused by complications from just a minor scrape to an urinary infection or a major surgery. Sepsis leads to tissue damage, organ failure, and even death. Every two minutes, somebody in America dies from sepsis. Really? Wow. And the other part of this is one minute you don't have it, the next minute you do. It's an extremely fast-acting infection. So what the, you know, there's a statewide initiative, and it's called See It, Stop It, and Survive It. And Woodlawn's part of that initiative where we're doing some screening upon admission. Um, so if you come into the ER or into an inpatient unit, we're going to do a sepsis screen on you to make sure that, you know, that little bug is not brewing out there that you're not aware of, we're not aware of, because the sooner we start getting, you know, some fairly uh, high-dose antibiotics on board, we can prevent it. But it just is very fast-acting, and, uh, you know, people pass away from that, from sepsis. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of been overlooked, I think, in the past. And it's more of awareness of it now. So that was one of the things that, you know, we're going to start doing that. And so the board was aware of that also. John, a question from a listener. Is that toxic shock syndrome? Is that the same type thing or it, are they different? Yeah, it's kind of the same it's thing. It's kind of the same uh, thing. Okay. Know, it's a, basically, it's a blood-borne infection. So right. as you can imagine, you know, your blood's circulating through your body. So it doesn't just affect one spot. It hits the whole body, all your organs at the same time. So it's a major shock wow. to your system. So, you know, we're very aware of that now. Like I say, doing the screens when you come into ER, we're doing it as an inpatient. Some of the things as a patient you need to be aware of that, uh, you know, kind of we use the word sepsis and, uh, you know, S-E-P-S-I-S. There's an acronym. So if you have shivering, fever, or you're feeling very cold, extreme pain or feeling worse than you've ever felt before, <laughs> pale or discolored skin, sleeplessness, difficulty waking up and confusion. You just get the feeling, I think I'm going to die. Yeah. And, you know, you've had, you were just, this sick as I've ever been, or shortness of breath. That are some of the signs and symptoms of sepsis. Okay. So, you know, it's not something to say, I'm going to wait till tomorrow to see if I get better. You know, if you're having, you know, some these symptoms, seek immediate medical attention because sepsis is extremely fast acting. And, you know, if we get antibiotics on board real quick, we can knock it, but okay. boy, if, if you let it go too long, you might have two to three weeks where you're in the hospital as an inpatient, and you're going to be one very, very sick individual. So we're it's just we wanted that awareness to get out there that you know it's been around forever, and it's kind of those things people just oh it's not going to happen to me, but you know I think now with more of the co super bugs that we're seeing because we've treated antibiotics for so many years for everything. It's in the food we eat, you know, because we give it to the, the chickens and the cows sure, and sure. stuff like that. Our bodies are becoming now to the point that the bugs say, I don't care what I am. I'm resistant to it because they evolve, you know, and we're to that point now. I think we've just got to that crisis. And, you know, that's one of the things the state's looking also is, are we using too many antibiotics? And so, you know, we get patients upset now. They'll come in and say, well, just give me something, you know, antibiotic. 
well, we got to find a different way because what's happening, we're creating all these, you know, germs that are becoming resistant to all the antibiotics we've got. So, and that's because we're just giving so many of those out. Right. So, you know, just be aware your physician might not be giving, you know, you come in with that sore throat, you're not going to get the amoxicillin right away. There might be other regimens they want to try. So we're not creating some of these resistant uh, bugs out there and germs that we can't treat long term. Okay. So the state's taking a really good initiative, and it's a good thing. We need to get this awareness out there. Be aware, you know, watch your antibiotics, but from sepsis, really pay attention. If you just get that, I am, I hurt all over, and, you know, the high fever, seek immediate medical attention because we want to get it as soon as we can to prevent some long-term damage to you. Good idea. And then we finally got into the financials okay. after that. Um, you know, for the, uh, for the month, we... Uh, uh, had gross revenue of about twelve point seven million, so a fairly good month of August. Wrote off about eight million, so we're again still, still about sixty sixty one percent write off. So that's give us our you know dollars to spend of four point nine nine million, and we spent four point nine two. So we actually had a profit for the month of twenty four thousand. And you know most businesses, if they had almost thirteen million dollars in revenue <laughs> and only make a twenty five thousand dollar profit, they'd be upset. We're overjoyed. You know, because, uh, again, so many write-offs in healthcare that, uh, you know, with our insurance contracts are just the folks don't have the ability to pay their bills. Right. Healthcare is expensive. And, uh, you know, you keep trying, is there ways to get around it? And not really. I mean, it, it's just an expensive business. Our equipment, you know, every year we're seeing, you know, 8 to 12% increase in the cost of equipment. Supplies are going up on average 10 to 15% per year. And then, you know, we're seeing right now and have been for the past year, tremendous amount of shortages in some of the drugs that we need to treat patients with. So, you know, some of the, the drugs that when I was watching, I was talking to our pharmacist, and, you know, we might have been paying $4 a bottle for. Now we're paying $400 for that same bottle because there's a shortage of it. And uh, some of the shortage is not the pills themselves. It's the glass for the bottles because it takes, you know, a special manufacturing sure. process, you know, make sure that they're, they're sterile so they can't get the glass. So it's just been a real fight this past year of, of the shortages and the escalating health care costs and you know it, it, we're aware of that and we do the best we can to try to control the cost at the hospital it, unfortunately it's just an expensive business so i hear you saying too that supply and demand affects health care it absolutely does you know once a, a product starts you know going away the price goes up and you know our pharmacist uh, he probably spends four to five hours a day shopping the market to try to find you know, the drugs that we need. And there's there's two markets. You know, you got your primary supply. Then there's a secondary market. And I kind of, you know, I call it the black market. Uh, I think where some folks have gone out and bought up a bunch of, you know, a particular drug, and now there's a shortage, they're the only one that has it. Right. So if, you know, kind of if you control the gold, you control the price. Right. And that's, you know, if we need that drug, we have to go to those secondary markets, and that's where we're paying 8, 10, 12, 20 times what we've been paying before, but we have to get it. You know, the patients need that. So you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a, you know, everybody thinks healthcare is a compassionate business. <laughs> it, it's On the backside, it's not. It's pretty cutthroat <laughs> where we're constantly trying to find where can we get the supplies we need without really having to pay an outright outrageous price for them. So John Alley's president and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. And anything else from the board meeting yesterday? That was pretty early. Like I said, you know, when Randall's retirement kind of overshadowed everything else. Did you have else. a cake? We had a cake yeah, for excellent. him. Yes, we did. Excellent. Okay. John, let me ask you this. Uh, we won't see you until towards the end of October, but October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, a very important month for, Absolutely, the, for the hospital you know, and for women in general. For women in general. You know, that again, I think there's a lot of awareness of that. And my fear is that, you know, kind of out of sight, out, out of mind, every, everybody hears it so much now. Are they going, oh, it's not going to affect me? So, yeah, definitely, you know, get with your medical provider. If, you're, if you haven't had your mammogram or your, your exam, get it done. Uh, lives can be saved by early detection. And with the technology that we have now, it's much better than it was two to five years ago. You know, the smallest little spot we can now find. Right. And the sooner you start treating that and seeing what it is and making sure that it's not a serious problem, the better you're going to be long term. So absolutely get with your healthcare provider, get your mammogram scheduled so we can make sure what's going on is, is nothing that you need to be worried about. Talking with Dr. Seward last or this week, as a matter of fact, and he said the same thing, you know, in terms of wellness, that's one way to keep yourself well. Basically. Yeah, just uh, I think we we don't follow the wellness as well as we should. If I'm not sick, 
Why do I need to worry about it? But, you know, a lot of these things with early detection can prevent some long-term serious illness. And, you know, I'm as guilty as anybody else. I feel fine. I don't need to do that. So, uh, you know, every now and then I get reminded by staff, you know, you're not as young as you used to be. You need to start getting some of these tests done to make sure that everything's still working like it should. Does Woodlawn Hospital pay attention to things like uh, Affordable Care Act, all the things that have been going on? It appears now the Republicans' new plan in the Senate is not going to go anywhere. So that puts Woodlawn basically where you've been for the last year or two. Right. It's, you know, you, you kind of get excited about some of the changes, then it kind of goes away. So we watch it. Um, but the problem I've got right now, there is daily changes to all this. So it's hard to plan what do we think is going to come out of it? And, you know, we've got, uh, you know, the IHA and, and American Hospital Association have folks in D.C., so we kind of look to them, and even we're kind of getting, they're throwing their hands in the air saying, we don't know what's coming, you know, because it's so volatile right now in D.C. that, you know, everybody's wanting their own different version of that plan, so, you know, we don't have a good sense of anything concrete that we can say, okay, let's kind of plan on this model coming out. But we do watch it. Uh, we sit back and, uh, you know, you try to read as much as you can, listen as much as you can, pay attention to the folks, you know, from our organizations that have got folks in D.C., you know, so boots on the ground, so to speak. But it's just hard right now to make a prediction what's going to come out of this whole plan. And uh, I think once we get the infighting done in D.C. and maybe they start working together, we'll get some sense of some type of plan that is going to be coming out. I'm, I'm a firm believer we're going to see a change of some sort. I just don't know what it is at this point. Last thought for today, John, and that is that uh, hospitals actually boil down to the people that work there. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I've, I've said this you many, have. many times before. I've got an excellent staff at the hospital. Um, they make my job super easy. Uh, I always try to hire somebody much smarter than myself. And, and, you know, it shows. We've got some excellent folks, and I don't care what position in the hospital. They truly care about the patient's and the facility. And it shows in our work and our work ethic. And uh, I couldn't be happier any place to work. And, uh, you know, kind of my first day there was when this is where I want to retire from. It was just that atmosphere and it's grown and, and become much more of a, a caring family type thing. And uh, it's just, I enjoy, I, I'll take my name badge off every now and then and, and go down and push patients in wheelchairs and just talk to them. Sure. Because, you know, kind of what's their opinion? And I'm getting that feedback from them that they truly enjoy, you know, the, and I'm sick. And if I had to come any place, I'm glad I'm coming here. And, uh, you know, every now and then we do have to transfer patients. They're just too sick for us to take care of here. And they'll say, well, please don't transfer me. Can I stay here? And, and no, it's the best thing for you to go somewhere else. You know, to me, that's a testament to the staff. They're doing what they need to do, treating the patients with care, compassion, and they truly care about them. You know, we all have bad days. Uh, you know, I, I'm not, everybody has that bad day. But I think overall, staff is just outstanding in how they interrelate with each other, the patient and families. I, I couldn't be prouder. John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Keep up the good work for our medical issues, will you please? I, I'll do my best. Like I say, I got extremely smart people <laughs> helping me to, and keeping me going the direction I need to go. John Alley, thanks very much. Thank you. 